Well, let's pick up some of the themes in that conversation. How does the acceptance of new countries into BRICS, like Argentina, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt, have on this journey to a shift, potentially, in the balance of power in the world? Who's the top dog at the BRICS table? And how much influence does that country wield in the bloc? Let's discuss now with the author of When China Rules the World, Professor Martin Jacques, who is also a former senior fellow at Cambridge University. Prof, good evening. Welcome. You wrote that book 14 years ago, and it explained then that for over 200 years, the world has been Western influenced, and that was about to change with the rise of powerful non-Western countries in which China would be the central player. Are we watching in this moment a significant move towards rebalancing the world order at the BRICS table, given the new members and the potential for others to be accepted? Yes, I definitely think this is a, a key moment on the journey you've just described, where the world, which was once dominated by the West and it, which dominated global institutions and which are still, of course, a very Western orientated, but you can feel the way in which the developing world, you know, home to 85% of the world's population is increasingly finding its foot feet, is increasingly exercising uh, its strength, its influence, and so on, building its own institutions. I think this is extremely important. And I think it's fascinating that BRICS has captured this moment so well. I mean, in a way, this is the most odd organization, you know, being founded initially in response to a sort of Jim O'Neill, chief economist of Goldman Sachs at the time, suggestion. Um, so it was, in a way, you know, an institutional oxymoron the way it started. But look what's happened. It's actually become the institution for our times or this particular time. And it's interesting the way in which this last year has there's been this gathering momentum of applications to join BRICS. Why BRICS? Because somehow BRICS seem to be a way of expressing the view of the global south, the opinion, the desires of the global south in this situation. And it's ironic, you know, that the Ukraine war was probably a key um, uh, influence, motivator, uh, a stepping off point, if you like, for this development. I want to stay with the theme of narrative building. And it's so interesting, depending on, you know, who you talk to, um, you know, how the different narratives about what BRICS means in this particular moment and how it shaped. You've heard the concept of, you know, tr trying to, you know, promote uh, an anti-Western stance or taking decisions that are trying to create a new almost, you know, a, 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 you know, uh, independent of the West, uh, West influence block on its own. And uh, as we heard in that previous interview, it's about finding the languaging once all of this lands at the end about what it really means uh, in terms of the bloc wanting to pursue its own identity in the contemporary world, uh, you know, away from, from how Western governments are making decisions and influencing financial institutions, uh, and also the global south really coming into its own in this moment. How would you sum up this moment in terms of what it means? Well, I think you've got two different aspects. Firstly, you've got the, nece the necessity and the desire of the developing world to have its own institutions, to develop its own institutions. I mean, look historically, though the global institutions in inverted commas were essentially Western institutions uh, like G7 and, and so on. Um, and uh, one of the characteristics of the developing world is relative lack of institutions, relative lack of connections, connectivity and so on. And you can feel that situation's now changing. It's not just bri uh, BRICS. For example, look at Belt and Road. This is a very powerful expression of this process as well. So what you're, what you're having, I think, is a growing institutional momentum in the developing world for new forms of connectivity and representativity. Alongside that, of course, you're right, there's the question of the nature of the existing global institutions and the Western dominance of these institutions. And clearly one of the factors that has, has attracted uh, 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 nations to join BRICS in this situation, and now countries are going to look towards BRICS, is the desire to rebalance the global economy and rebalance the global uh, polity to give the developing world a proper voice, which it yeah. still 
to not have. But it does seem to, to be that there is competition uh, inside of this now. Is, is China the top dog, Prof, calling the shots here? How would you evaluate the influence it has had at this BRICS summit? Well, I think it's extremely important that BRICS maintains, essentially, a co operates on a consensual basis. I mean, there is actually a precedent for this, which is ASEAN. ASEAN n never votes. It, everything is done by consensus. And I think it would be most desirable uh, if uh, uh, this kind of idea continues to inform the way in which BRICS operates. I mean, for example, you could have had all sorts of tensions, and no doubt you have conflicts between India and China. There's, reason, there's good reasons for it. But it seems to me that so far, BRICS actually has been a very good forum for their relationship. And I think that spirit uh, needs uh, to continue. Now, if you're asking me, well, you know, what's the most important country in uh, 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 BRICS? Obviously, China, by a long, long way, is the most uh, uh, powerful country because it's got such a huge economic weight. But it has to exercise that in a consensual way. Uh, it, you know, that so South Africa and South Africa and uh, and China, as far as possible, have an equal voice uh, in BRICS. Now, if if BRICS can develop that kind of culture, it's going to have a great influence on the developing world and the world more widely. Yeah. China's got a 19.37 trillion uh, dollar muscle. Speaking of muscle, though, how much more muscle, and, and a quick answer for me, Prof, please, if you can, how much more muscle does the inclusion of six new members as of January next year uh, bring, given three of them, Iran, UAE, Saudi Arabia, three of the world's biggest oil producers, and before that, uh, the fact that the bloc accounted for almost half the global population, and now 30% of global GDP? Yeah, I mean, it's gone up from, I think it's more than that, actually. I think it's gone up from 32 to 37% of global G GDP, according to purchasing power parity. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pushing 40% of the global economy. That is, that is, that's impressive and, and very important. And uh, it's a signal of, you know, we're entering a new world. Yes, I think China is the most influential country in the world and the most powerful country in the world in, in key respects. But you know, this is the moment of the developing world. It is not just the moment of China. It is the moment of the developing, wor uh, uh, de developing world. And you've got to remember anyway that China is part and parcel of the great revolution after the Second World War, which was anti-colonialism, independence, and the formation of many new developing countries, of which China was one. Prof, we could talk about this for hours, and I think that you shared uh, some really refreshing insights. Thank you for doing that and giving your time to us tonight. Professor Martin Jacques, the author of When China Rules the World, and a former senior, senior fellow at Cambridge University.